Welcome, everybody. Um, I guess we're going to get started. Uh, I'm Hugh again, uh, back for my third and last appearance today, so I won't have much to say. On my immediate left is Ambassador Winston Lord, his most recent book, Kissinger on Kissinger. I cannot recommend highly enough to everyone here. It's really a remarkable series of conversations with Dr. Kissinger about all things, including China. On his left, Ambassador Chase, Fr Chase Friedman from the Watson Institute, and then, of course, uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy from the Wilson Center. And I've got um, Rob Litwack on the far end, who is, of course, the executive director here at the Wilson Center. He's going to lead it off and ask most of the questions as we go into our, our final sprint around the track. Thank wow. you, Hugh. And <coughs> what an honor it is to, to uh, be participating in a conversation with uh, three of America's most distinguished diplomats. Um, uh, am I audible here? I once heard uh, Dr. Kissinger uh, uh, speaking at CSIS, and uh, uh, the chair of the meeting said, uh, can everyone hear me? And from the side, you, hear doc you heard Dr. Kissinger say, by definition, those who cannot hear you will not reply. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, hope, uh, I hope I'm audible. Okay. Uh, um, let me um, start, I guess, with a, at an, obvi at an obvious point, which is that Richard Nixon, uh, was able to work with Mao Zedong because he had a clear view of American interests. And the two leaders shared the view that the foundation of bilateral relations lay in countering the Soviet Union. So what is the foundation of the relationship now, do you think? And we'll start with well, Winston me, Lord, who- Can I just hit a couple of grace notes first because it's so personal to me. I can't think of a more meaningful forum to me than this one because of the combination of the two conveners. You have the Kissinger Institute and my relationship with him. Mm. Bob Daly and I worked together in the embassy uh, in the late 80s. State saved me from one crisis. I saved him from another when we were in mm. government. Uh, so this is meaningful in that grounds. And then the Nixon Library and Foundation, I've been out there many times, just came back. Uh, the foundation was responsible for the book you mentioned because we had a series of interviews before we sat down with Kissinger on Nixon foreign policy and then persuaded him to do what turned into the book. So this is particularly meaningful for me and I don't want to take time on it, but I just felt I'm obligated and, and motivated to do so. One last comment uh, about today's being relevant. We mentioned Fred Malik at the beginning. Yes. Fred Malik and my son brought baseball to Washington, and I mention that because the Nationals are now in the World <laughs> Series. Being a Mets fan, I'm not too happy about that. Anyway, they, put, they got the team here, and then the commissioner at the time gave it to another ownership, and I've been outraged <laughs> ever since. Look, we're at a serious juncture now, and it, it's tempting on this kind of question to go on for about 20 minutes, so I'll try to keep this brief. We all should try to do that. But it's the most serious juncture in our relationship. And I think we have to steer between being a panda hugger and a dragon slayer. Uh, we should recognize the importance of this relationship, the fact we can't let it descend into conflict. We should, in my view, recognize that the Chinese, both at home and abroad, have been the major culprit in the deterioration of the relationship. And we need firmer pushback in certain areas. Uh, and I think we have to recognize that we need a course correction in our policy. But at the same time, we should not consider them a permanent enemy or head in that direction. So I, I, I'm down the middle on this. But the foundations remain there if, if we can work at it. And the theme today, I would emphasize now, the three major foundations of our policy toward China, which can turn it into a smart, <coughs> manageable competition not enmity and not come by our, is get your act together at home, both in terms of our political system and investing in the future and a showcase for democracy. Work with like-minded countries and allies, including on the trade issue where we have more leverage if we do so, and supplement our strength through multilateral institutions like the Trans-Pacific Partnership we withdrew from, the Iran nuclear deal, climate change, et cetera. That's the most important thing is what we do ourselves. We should welcome the competition from China as a ways to get our own act together. We should be firm and push back, as I said, where they've been aggressive. Uh, but we should also seek areas where we continue to cooperate and manage those areas where we can't. So 
I think the foundations there are not only the economic interactions, the global challenges that we can share uh, principles and policies on, uh, but in terms of getting our own act together. And so I, I'm not despairing, I'm concerned, and until we get these three pillars straight of domestic strength, mm -hmm. allied unity, and international leadership, uh, we're going to have trouble. Chess? Um, I actually I didn't understand what the format was, so. Uh, Did you prepare it, some remarks? I, uh, yeah, I spent a couple of days uh, <laughs> thinking about it, and um, so uh, I have about uh, eight or nine minutes of remarks. Is that too long? No. Okay. No. Thank you very much. Um, then uh, I'll hold forth. I would have taken eight or nine minutes, not fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Wilson Center was established 51 years ago in 1968, which was about the time I returned to Washington from my first tour in the Foreign Service in South India, where I learned Tamil but concealed that from the authorities, which was a good thing or I would have spent the rest of my life commuting between Colombo and what is now called Chennai. Huh. Um, at that time, man had not lan yet landed on the moon, and neither Nixon nor Kissinger had arrived in Beijing. Uh, before he was elected, and I think this is a crucial point, Richard Nixon had already concluded that no world order that excluded China could be stable. After he took office in 1969, clashes broke out along the Sino-Soviet frontier, and I think Nixon clearly feared the geopolitical consequences of a Soviet military conquest or a humiliation of China. And so his administration began the politically and institutionally difficult process of changing U.S. policy toward China. It switched from using Taiwan to contain the PRC to enlisting the PRC to contain the USSR. Doing so required addressing Chinese demands that the United States withdraw our military presence from Taiwan terminate our defense treaty with Taipei, and recognize Beijing rather than Taipei as the capital of an undivided China. Nixon knew this. He believed it was in the strategic interest of the United States, and, and he proceeded. There was no sentiment in Nixon's- Excuse me, he didn't do any one of those three things, though. They were done later. I'm not saying right or wrong. He didn't do any one of those three in the Shanghai communique when we were there. Not one of those three. Uh, no, he, he addressed those questions, saying that U.S. forces in Taiwan would be reduced as, uh, as, uh, as the area proceeded toward peace. Um, he, uh, he did not address the defense treaty, and he did not uh, switch recognition. That's all very correct. But he set in motion a process that was very clearly aimed at those things. There was no sentiment in Nixon's decision. He was famously cynical. He did not imagine that recruiting China in support of the so-called free world would result in China joining it or embracing America's liberal democratic ideology. If he was remorseful at all about switching sides in the Chinese Civil War, he gave no sign of this. 1972, Nixon dramatically visited Beijing, the capital of a then hostile regime Americans did not recognize and with which the alternative Chinese government we had long championed was locked in an unresolved civil war. Nixon artfully finessed the Taiwan question, privately assuring Mao and Zhou that he would recognize the PRC in his second term. Watergate then struck Nixon down. Gerald Ford's accidental pre presidency was too politically precarious for him to implement Nixon's pledge. It was left to Jimmy Carter to normalize relations with the PRC then led by Deng Xiaoping. Deng needed an opening to the United States for two reasons. First, tactically, to put the USSR off balance as he used force to convince Hanoi that allying itself with Moscow would cost it vastly more than it could ever hope to gain. And second, strategically, to de-Sovietize China's domestic political economy. Some Americans understood Deng's geopolitical strategy. None understood his ambitions for domestic reform. But it was Deng's opening of China to American influence that transformed not only China, but also world affairs. Uh, it's instructive to compare the situation then, before Deng's policies of reform and opening, with now. In 1972, 
The United States was concerned about China's weakness and backwardness. Now we're apprehensive about its strength and technological advance. In 1972, the United States was very much the senior partner in the Sino-American relationship. Now we must deal with China as an equal. Both countries are having trouble adjusting to this change. In 1972, Sino-American relations were remodeled by mutual accommodation. Now they're being transformed by escalating mutual antagonism. In 1972, the United States was concerned about the consequences of China's exclusion from the Pax Americana. Now Washington is obsessed with the consequences of China's inclusion in global and regional governance. Americans seek to preserve our global and Indo-Pacific uh, primacy. Chinese insist on a role in global and regional, uh, regional governance commensurate with their regained economic and military power. In 1972, the United States and China set aside ideological differences to pursue some common interests. The United States now sees such differences as impediments to cooperation with China, even on obvious common interests. In 1972, the United States and China began to forge an entente, a limited partnership for limited purposes, to check the political military threat to both that Soviet aspirations for global hegemony represented. Together, over the next two decades, Americans and Chinese helped validate George Kennan's judgment that if isolated, the Soviet Union's def defects would eventually bring it down. With no common military adversary to confront and contain, the Nixon-Carter finesse of the Taiwan issue and the cross-strait understandings that have kept the peace between Taipei and Beijing are now unraveling. The risk of a war to determine Taiwan's relationship with the rest of China is the highest it's been in decades. Apart from the potentially devastating consequences of mismanaging the Taiwan issue, the threats to China and the United States are global in nature and have no conceivable military solution. Human-induced climate change, nuclear nonproliferation, regional instability in China's near abroad, Islamist terrorism, and maintaining a world order conducive to stability and prosperity are or should be concerns of both countries. These, inter these interests provide an obvious basis for cooperation. Yet in almost every arena, the United States and China are now working at cross purposes. To both Americans and Chinese, it was simply inconceivable that the notoriously anti-communist Richard Nixon would reach out to the famously anti-capitalist Mao Zedong. Richard Nixon, let's remember, had been the single Republican most closely associated with Joe McCarthy. In the early 1950s, he had taken the lead in smearing America's China hands as traitors, bent on enabling a communist victory over Chiang Kai-shek. In 1950, Mao, for his part, had taken China into alliance with the Soviet Union, then into combat with the United States in Korea. But when either Nixon or Mao saw a strategic opportunity for his country, each proved able to set aside both prejudice and the conventional wisdom to seize the opportunity. If such courageous and visionary leaders are alive today, when Lord is alive, I have noticed, <laughs> um, um, they are hiding themselves very, very well. Sino-American relations are in the process of returning to the fallacious stereotypes and unreasoning hostility that Nixon and Mao acted to set aside five decades ago. This promise is to make the world a much more dangerous place and a much less prosperous place than it has been since the two sides decided to replace enmity with peaceful rapprochement and expanding cooperation. I think all three members of this panel can remember a time when China and the United States knew nothing of each other and imagined that was everything we needed to know. Um, Beijing and Washington each snarled and pronounced anathema on the other. Neither benefited from this, but most in both countries took it for granted that we were mortal enemies and destined to remain so. Sadly, we now seem to be headed back to a level of estrangement that endangers us and everyone associated with us. Nixon, Kissinger, Mao, and Zhou were right. 
There's more to be gained by what the Chinese call Chiu Tong Sun Yi, seeking common ground while shelving differences for later resolution, than by tit for tat antagonism. The United States and China can be for each other on some issues, even as they are against each other on others. And if Americans and Chinese cannot bring ourselves to act jointly to realize common interests, we can still act in parallel, taking different roads to a common end, uh, which is Itu Tonggui. That common destination had better not be war, which could literally be fatal, fatal to both societies. I think the restoration of mutual respect and, a sh uh, and uh, can, uh, is necessary to assure peace and prosperity for the people of both China and the United States. It awaits a new Richard Nixon. Thank you, Chaz. Um, I've been doing a mathematical calculation here. Uh, Win got four minutes, Chaz got eight, so that means I get 12. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Creative let math. Me, let me, you let got me, a lot to re react to, <coughs> Dave. Go ahead. Let me try to answer your question. And it was um, Chaz answered it, uh, I thought, eloquently. Um, the basis for the United States relationship with China is the same as it was in 1972 with Nixon. Threat. It was the common perception of the Soviet Union as a threat to both countries that created the glue that enabled us to get the relationship off onto a new basis. And now, 40 years later, each of us sees the other as the principal threat. Mm -hmm. And our relationship is being driven by that. The threat perception on the Soviet Union was inadequate to, to cover the range of interests that once we had broken the ice, leaders on both sides recognized we needed a broader relationship. Uh, and right up until 1989, the Soviet threat provided sufficient underpinning for the relationship that we were able to go through the very difficult process of setting up a normal relationship from an extraordinarily abnormal relationship. We then went through a period w when it was in the middle of this, and I was the ambassador in Beijing at the time, when we essentially lost the Soviet threat as a basis for the relationship, our public opinion toward China had turned hostile, and we did not have a national understanding of what the basis for the relationship should be. Mm. Uh, by the end of the decade, we had begun to realize that China was emerging as a major country. And there was a period during the latter Clinton administration, uh, right through the early Obama administration, when essentially we were dealing with China as a major country that we had to deal with as a major country. But then, and it was partly driven by the uh, global financial crisis and the loss of confidence in the West in our own future, that we increasingly began to see China emerging as a threat, not just a ma major country, but as an emerging threat to the United States. Uh, that's where we are at present. And that's where China is at present. <coughs> the irony of the situation is that we see China as an external threat, and China, in many ways, sees us as an internal threat. Mm. There has been much criticism of our engagement policy with China on the grounds that it failed in its alleged purpose, which I happen to think was not its purpose, but its alleged purpose of turning China into a liberal democracy. Uh, and yet what we have is a reemergence of repression in China in which the leader of China is trying to repress the very ideas which are characteristic of liberal democracies that have taken root in China. Mm -hmm. And he is waging an ideological campaign to try to stamp out Western influences and to insist that socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, even though in his speeches he acknowledges uh, doesn't have all the advantages that the um, democratic countries have, that the capitalist countries have, but he, he says this is the only system that China can have. And so what we're seeing both in Xinjiang, in uh, Hong Kong, uh, in some ways in the way they're dealing with China, China has lots of threats, and all of them have a domestic component. 
you have separatism in, in, um, in Xinjiang. Uh, it's separatism, not terrorism, that is the root of their repression there. In Hong Kong, we see the yearning of the, of the Chinese people in Hong Kong not to lose the privileges that they enjoy under the Basic Act that was negotiated in 1997. And in Taiwan, you have people who increasingly feel alienated from a Chinese personality and are beginning to think of themselves with a Taiwan personality. And this is a threat to China. But we are also an external threat. So in a sense, China has this double problem of us as the principal external threat and the ideas we represent as creating a more, a, a more difficult domestic threat for China to deal with. At the moment, because we are seeing China principally as a threat, we are not able to take advantage of the attractiveness of our system to the, pe to the people of China. Hmm. Uh, and that is what I would call the principal flaw. Just as we required normalization of our relationship during the 70s and 80s in order to be able to get, take advantage of the commonalities between our two countries, the common interests, right now, we have to get over this sense of only being driven by concern about the China threat and begin to realize that we have to deal with that aspect of the relationship. But as um, both Wynn and, uh, and Chaz have touched on, there's a host of other areas where we have a common interest with China. Both of us will benefit from having a prosperous and stable Indo-Pacific region, and we can't get that unless the United States and China are willing to work together. Uh, if you don't have a prosperous and stable region, which we actually achieved for much of the last 40 years, uh, because China and the United States were working together, then we are going to damage the interests of all of the countries of the Indo-Pacific region, and that's not going to be in our interest. So I think your question is a very good one, but the problem is, at the moment, we only understand the threat aspect of the basis for our relationship, and we are not showing wisdom in understanding the areas where there are opportunities for cooperation. Could I make a comment? These are both excellent. Yes. Uh, since the title of this session is partly an excellent legacy, so I think you were very correct, Chad, to lead off as you did. And I would like to fill in just a little bit. I thought it was a very good rundown, uh, but a little more background on the opening of what Nixon was up to here. And you can get it all in my book, but I, <laughs> so I should hold back a bit. Uh, but very, very quickly, uh, you mentioned how Nixon came in, Foreign Affairs article, Don't Leave China Outside His. He wanted to open up to China yep. primarily for a world order and so on. Kissinger separately, they didn't know each other. He, Nixon chose Nixon, a conservative Californian, distrustful of the Ivy League, somewhat sem anti Semitic. Who does he choose as his national security advisor? A Harvard professor and every good Jewish person who worked for Nelson Rockefeller, his opponent. <laughs> he also chose Daniel Moynihan on the domestic side. So this man had courage from the beginning. So that was his emphasis. Kissinger's emphasis was more balance of power. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in terms of the motives, you've hit some of them. But on the US side, uh, on the Russians' part, it wasn't just to balance the Russians, uh, Soviets. It was to improve relations with them. Yeah. When we started yeah. sending public signals of the direction we were headed toward in terms of China, the Soviet experts in the State Department unanimously warned Nixon not to open up with Beijing because it would hurt our relations with Moscow, <laughs> which our, at that point, nuclear stalemate was the overriding priority. George Kennan, uh, Chip Boland, Tommy Thompson, Foy Kohler said, don't open up with China, you hurt relations mm -hmm. with Moscow. And State was sitting in Moscow at the time, so he'll want to comment on this. Within, I won't go to detail because I want to save time here, but within a week or two of the announcement of our secret trip and Nixon's coming trip, the Soviets agreed to a summit, which they've been dragging their feet on for two years. We made major progress in Berlin, major progress in arms control and detente. So the objective was not just to balance China, but to have better relations with each of those communist giants than they had with each other, and, and it worked. Secondly, secondary goals of Nixon and Kissinger for the opening. Uh, try to get some help bring the Vietnam War to an end. These are the two major patrons right. of Hanoi, so therefore we might isolate them, at least psychologically, if we opened up. Greater stability in Asia, 
And then two, I think, very important results and hard to quantify. Number one, we were bogged down in a war. We had riots, assassinations, uh, protests at home, and it looked like we had no diplomatic uh, dexterity abroad. And by opening up dramatically with a fifth of the world's people, we showed the U.S. could be a major diplomatic uh, giant again. And secondly, the American people were understandably fatigued and worn out by the Vietnam War, and it was going to be an ambiguous ending no matter what happened, not a march down Fifth Avenue. By opening up with this dramatic opening, it put this messy ending in Vietnam in some context in terms of geopolitical uh, objectives. On the Chinese side, you mentioned a couple of their incentives to open up, but I would argue one more, get out of their isolation. <clears throat> At the time we went there in July 71, they had one ambassador abroad in Egypt. The Cultural Revolution was still going on. Uh, they were totally isolated, and they calculated correctly that if we opened up with China, others, particularly Japan and Europe, would follow suit and they'd get into the United Nations. So it are those points. One last point, and then I want to make a point in state. Uh, we all talk about the courage of, of Nixon, and it, sure it was easier for him with his right flank protected than Hubert Humphrey, but it was still a courageous decision. Uh, but let's not forget the courage of the Chinese and their self-interest. If you look at the Shanghai communique, and you touched on this, the Chinese, as you said, and one of you said, we have to kick some of these tough, I think you did, today even, issues mm -hmm. down the road and work where we can cooperate. They'd always insisted that you can't have a dialogue with, uh, with them unless we solve the Taiwan issue. We wouldn't even go to China until we established through secret channels that they would talk about other issues. And then, yes, we had to agree to a one China. We kept it fuzzy. But look at the concessions China made on Taiwan. We maintained diplomatic relations with Taipei. We maintained troops on Taiwan. And the few that we said we might reduce as the tensions in the area reduced was to give Chinese an incentive to end the Vietnam War so we could take right. some of those Vietnam-related troops out. And Kissinger on Chinese soil reaffirmed our defense treaty. So there was tremendous courage and vision on both sides, the theme of your remarks. And I just wanted to add those things to your excellent rundown. One last point uh, Stape has articulated, and I think this conference has, that we ought to be in a smart competition with China. It is a strategic competition. But we should have every sense that we've got assets compared to them. They've got 14 neighbors, uh, all of them are either terrorists or have nuclear weapons of border disputes. And we've got two oceans in Mexico and Canada. There's a whole list of assets we've got they don't have, and they've got huge problems. But if we don't get our act together, if we don't work with our friends, and mm -hmm. we pull out of international leadership, we're going to lose out. So let's welcome this as a competition, not as an inevitable conflict. Hmm. Could I make a, uh, just two very brief comments? Um, first, um, on Kissinger. Um, I joined the Foreign Service in part because uh, I was bored at law school and reading <laughs> history at the Wagner Library and uh, came to China and have a long family connection with China, which I hadn't really considered. Uh, but it seemed to me that the world was geopolitically unstable with China in isolation and that we would have to move to correct that. When Henry Kissinger was rather improbably, as Wynne said, selected to be the national security advisor, I was delighted primarily because of his great book, A World Restored. A World Restored is partly, it's probably the best description of the European balance of power ever written. Uh, but it is also the description of a strategy by Metternich the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, to um, pull the fangs of the French Revolution. After the Napoleonic Wars, uh, he and others uh, did uh, something which we failed to remember in the wars of the 20th century. Namely, he reintegrated France into the order and made them part of the uh, councils of governance of the European <laughs> system, uh, so that they had an interest in stability rather than promoting uh, instability. And I saw this as applying very much to China. On the other hand, I think in your book, Kissinger on Kissinger, it comes across very clearly uh, 
uh, and I saw this at the time, that because he was tactically engaged with the Vietnamese, uh, he was more intent on the Vietnam side than Nixon was. So there was an odd juxtaposition of Nixon as strategic thinker determined to open to China and Kissinger, a belated convert to that, to that uh, thought. The second point well, is… He wasn't belated convert. They each came into office uh, thinking we should open. They just yeah. had different motives. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the second point, very briefly, is that you're, I think you're absolutely correct to emphasize the essence of the policy was to have a better relationship with Beijing and Moscow than they had with each other. Mm. We've now accomplished the opposite. <laughs> I, I, if I could ask a question of all three, yes. we've got such a collection of wisdom. All day long, people have talked about China as being a force to be acted upon or which will act upon us. It's all about sticks and carrots. In your collective experience, is there any persuading, I mean, talking political theory with the Chinese leadership that would persuade them on anything, for example, on religious liberty? I mean, if you want social credit score, Import Baptists, they're the best social credit people in the world. Is there any persuading them to do things differently or does it all have to be sticks and carrots? Ambassador Roy. My principal experience was with the Soviet Union and China. And I found them both easier to negotiate with than some of the countries of Southeast Asia where I serve. Because if you could muster a good logical reason for doing something, it had impact on them. That's what I mean. uh, whereas when you're dealing as a big country with a small country, it becomes a issue of trade-offs that has no logic behind it. Uh, I negotiated a science and technology agreement with Thailand, for example, where they wouldn't agree to correct a typo if you didn't make a concession to them because you spotted the typo, so therefore to, for them to correct it, you had to give them something additional. <laughs> uh, that was not the case um, uh, with China. The power of example is very powerful in both countries. The Soviet Union dealt with the problem by not permitting their citizens to have any access to the outside world. So they were able to convince many Soviet citizens when I lived there that their standard of living was better than that of the United States. In fact, their standard of living was below that of East Germany, it was below that of Poland, it was below that of Czechoslovakia. Uh, but Soviet citizens didn't know that because they didn't have free access to Eastern Europe. Uh, China, in an act of unbelievable self-confidence, uh, ended up flooding us with their uh, best and brightest students. And so they had a very realistic understanding of the advantages of the Western economic and political system in encouraging general prosperity in the countries. But we didn't, um, we didn't persuade the Chinese of this. We let them see it. And this had had the, the impact that Xi Jinping is struggling with right now. And in his speeches, he talks about the fact that we're going to have to deal with the fact that the, um, the, the, the what, what does he call it, the capitalist systems of the West are going to use our disadvantages to, to criticize us. And that's exactly what's happening. And many Chinese believe that the capitalist system, or the market system, shall we say, can deliver better advantages for China than the type of socialism that they're trying to re re restore. So uh, I, th I, I, I find that logic works well with the Chinese. Uh, but you also need to have a powerful example to support the logic. And then you have an overwhelming ability to shift their viewpoint. Chaz, before you reply, can I just build on, on Hugh's comment? Because one of the, uh, Hugh's, Hugh's focuses on an important aspect of the relationship and, and uh, um, how do we uh, have some type of co-evolution or, or some meeting of, of interest between the two sides. But underlying a lot of our conversation today has been the relationship between foreign policy and domestic prospects in China. 
and Kissinger, uh, Nixon and Kissinger both viewed in the realist tradition of, um, of foreign policy, focused on uh, a stable distribution of power among states as a key to achieving international peace. The institution that uh, I worked, Wilson, that, that we memorialized, he's, he's rooted in an alternative view of international relations where you focus on domestic politics and democratic governance with market economies. Uh, rooted in international institutions with norms, the proverbial rules-based system. That's the key to um, uh, achieving a Pacific uh, international system. In your conversations, you know, at the beginning of this change relationship, which had a geostrategic kind of impetus, you know, the Usuri River clash, the possibilities that, that created, in, was there ever a kind of a tacit discussion of like, if the relationship changed, that there was sort of an implicit uh, discussion, you know, assumption about the prospects for domestic political change in, in China, that if they integrate it into the system, you create a middle class, you need rule of law for d commercial transactions. Was there any kind of sense of uh, implicitly that what you were trying to achieve on a geostrategic level could open the door to some type of domestic political evolution or not? No. No. I, I want to give you one quick answer, but the answer is no, it didn't come up. Uh, this was when China was very weak, and we had no sense that it ever grow into the, the behemoth that it's become today and also raise some of these issues. So I can elaborate, but, and I'll get back to it, but I want to uh, pick up, I think State gave a terrific answer. Really what you're saying is logic, but really you're saying you've got to demonstrate to them their self-interest, their okay. self-interest in doing it. I'll give you just a couple examples. One, in the early 70s, uh, the only relationship we had was conceptual, essentially. We didn't have concrete interests or negotiations or exchanges. But we did talk a lot, and the Kissinger, Joe, and Lai conversations were incredible. But I'll give you an example. It's one of the few examples of maybe persuasion, but it really was appealing to their self-interest. When we first got there, uh, Mao and Joe complained about the U.S.-Japan alliance. They said this was destabilizing, dangerous, a threat to China. Kissinger worked for a couple of trips saying, look, you're nuts. By our relationship with Japan and the security umbrella, we're keeping Japan from rearming uh, and being more of a threat to you. And believe it or not, yeah. after a couple of years, the Chinese came around on this. And I think it was primarily this argument that did it. In fact, after the shock to Japan when we opened up, Mao kept telling us we ought to go to Japan more often. Kissinger, you know, pay attention yeah. to Japan and so on. So that's. That's not going to happen today, and you don't have Joe's and Kissinger's around, not to mention Nixon's uh, and Mao's. But I do think the same principle applies that Stape was saying. I'll take two current examples. The Iran nuclear agreement, we worked with China before this administration, as well as Russia. I'm sure we were making the argument, you have an interest <coughs> in Iran not disrupting your oil supplies, which you have such a heavy interest in, and we've got to get the nuclear capability under control. So I think that's the main reason China did it. They always act in their self-interest, as most countries do, but China do a fairly well. And then climate change, uh, I'm sure they figured it out for themselves, but I would think Obama and others made the argument, it's ruining your own economy, uh, it's ruining your quality of life, it's producing a lot of the protests against your government uh, over environmental issues. There's a lot of money to be made with clean technology. <clears throat> Get your act together in climate change and join with us in serving, in, you know, solving this world problem. So I'm just elaborating, trying to give examples <clears throat> of what State was saying. Heavy pressures, uh, loss of face, direct confrontation is not very useful with them. Uh, certainly rolling over is not very useful. You've got to appeal uh, to their self-interest. Um, I want to try to join what Stape and, and Wynne just said, and Wynne, your earlier remark, which I agree with completely, that the key to successful competition is getting our own act together. Uh -huh. Instead of trying to keep China down, we should be trying to raise ourselves uh -huh. up. Um, and I think the, the key, one of, I would add to your list of our deficiencies at this moment, uh, with a, an apparent total inability to do diplomacy. Diplomacy rests on empathy. I just barely touched it on my list, by the way. I'm yeah. Long. No, I, but I mean, <laughs> internationally, yeah. this goes directly to the question that uh, that you asked about uh, you about the the, the uh, whether you can reason with the Chinese and persuade them. 
Yes, you can. If you are seen as friendly, um, not menacing, if you are seen as understanding their point of view and their interests, and maybe persuading them to take a different view of their own interests, so that this is what diplomacy is all about. It's about getting the other side to accept that it's in their interest to do what you want them to do. Um, at the moment, our approach to international affairs is almost exclusively coercive. It's not directed at uh, recognizing and trying to use the self-interest of the other side uh, to get them to do things. Uh, it's militarized. Uh, I think we have a major conceptual problem in this country, uh, which is the, in part the result of the fact that for a long time, uh, the Defense Department has financed um, international relations theory and political science in every university in the country. We have a copious literature of coercion. We have almost no literature of persuasion, short of And yet, in ordinary life, when we have a problem with our neighbor, if we're wise, we don't pull a gun and say, submit or else. Maximum pressure, the motto of this administration, now being applied to Iran, once applied to North Korea, maybe still applied to North Korea, was precisely the formula that convinced the Japanese in 1941 that they needed to do something desperate. We are risking doing that in other contexts, I don't think yet with China, but um, certainly the approach we're taking to China is designed to humiliate and force capitulation, and I don't think that works with them or very many other foreign mm -hmm. societies. Mm. Um, we could turn it over to the audience now, I think, and, and ask uh, uh, them for their questions. Um, and while you, okay, uh, please identify yourself. Is it on? You have to speak louder, please. I'm sorry. Microphone's probably not working. Yeah. Hand mic. Yeah. I think it's on. Yeah. Good. Uh, Katie Staller Blanchett. I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Center. Thank you so much. It's a, one of the great things about being here is being able to have this kind of caliber of, of panel uh, to, to enjoy. I just, I wonder whether you think there's any sort of parallel version of this conversation happening in China. Oh, great question. And if there is, what sort of conclusions they may be drawing about the state of the relationship? State wanted to take that on first. Is there a parallel? Did you hear the question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the short answer is for much of the last 30 years, you have essentially had free speech in China. You couldn't publish freely. But you, even highly sensitive issues, you could have discussions in China. Uh, at universities, at think tanks, uh, with government officials. Uh, but they, did, they couldn't publish uh, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, the Chinese ha have been wondering how to deal with us uh, for all of this period. Uh, we're not easy to get along with, hmm. partly because of the propensity we have, particularly in, the, in government and particularly in the Congress, to use threats and bullying as the way to try to get other countries to do what we want them to do instead of persuading them uh, that there's a common interest that will be served by uh, going the way we would like them to go. And this has been upsetting to the Chinese. They have held conferences trying to deal with the question of uh, how to manage the relationship with the United States better. The Chinese have discovered that as they have become stronger, they be, were, began to be seen as a threat by all of their neighbors. And so they have put particular focus on what they call Zhou Bian Wai Jiao, which is um, diplomacy around your periphery. Because they found that they were losing out in their diplomacy because they were being seen as mm -hmm. threatening mm 
as opposed to being able to use diplomacy to persuade their neighbors to behave in a better way. So the Chinese do indeed deal with these issues. The problem right now is that for the last few years, under Xi Jinping, they have been stamping out the ability to speak freely in China. And this even influences Chinese um, uh, professors, think tank people, government officials, even when they come here now. They are talking less f freely than they used to talk when you met with them in China even. So I think it's more difficult now for China to have the type of free and open discussion that they need, but this has been actually quite commonly taking place in China over much of the last 30 years. I want to echo that about the effect even on private conversations, but this doesn't directly answer your question, but I want to introduce a little balance in our discussion. We've all agreed that we can be ham-handed with China and we hurt a billion people's feelings occasionally and so on, and we've asked for a more sophisticated approach and we agree on that. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the current crisis in our relationship, I believe, is primarily China's fault. Uh, I won't go through a long list, but it started really in 2008 with a financial crisis where we fell on our face and China got some hubris, figuring they knew how to do things better than we did. The understandable uh, instincts to claim their rightful place on the world stage. I want to make clear they have a right to build up their military. They have a right to get greater seats at the table in international uh, organizations. They have a right to have legitimate public diplomacy uh, in other countries, and we've made some mistakes. So I'm not saying it's all one way, but on the whole, what she in particular have been doing uh, since he came in, and State was referred to that, is caused this crisis. Uh, we'd have a problem anyway, no matter who is president, because of the risen versus established power, with changing from rising now, I guess, to risen. Uh, that's going to create tensions and adjustment, particularly when the two sides have ideological differences and national interest differences and geographic tensions. Uh, so there's going to be a problem with any president. Uh, I happen to think that Trump has not responded in the correct way. I told the three things we ought to be doing, and he's not doing those. Uh, but at least he's raised, helped to raise the consciousness. However, let's not forget, as we talk about how we've got to be sensitive and sophisticated that the problem, I still believe, is primarily because of what China's been up to. Uh, I, I, I don't want to give a long litany because we don't have time, but what they've been doing at home, what Xi has done to consolidate his power, the Communist Party uh, in charge of everything, reversing economic reforms, uh, forced technology transfers, violating WTO, cyber theft, uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan squeezed, Hong Kong squeezed. Uh, interfering in our society in coercive and corrupt ways beyond public diplomacy, uh, the Uyghurs, the list goes on. And all of that has either been there before and accentuated by Xi, or it's been new elements that have introduced tension. So there's a reason why there's a bipartisan mood in this country. There's a danger of overreacting and not having the sophisticated approach and the smart competition we all in favor of. But there's a reason why the mood has shifted among think tank experts, among academics, among former government officials uh, to harden up versus China. Uh, so I just want to introduce that balance so we don't get overly self-flagellating here. We, uh, we are two continental societies. Continental societies tend to focus more on domestic than foreign affairs. Um, and it's domestic interests and issues that drive policy to a great extent in both countries. We also have in common the fact that we're both exceptionally self-righteous. <laughs> we never make mistakes um, on both sides. Uh, this is not conducive to uh, an effective relationship. It's a major obstacle to good relations because uh, I spoke about empathy as the basis of diplomacy. It's not enough to understand the interests of the other side. You also have to understand how the other side sees you. And that is very difficult. Um, and it is, seems to be particularly difficult, in my experience, for Chinese. <coughs> so um, I think uh, this is a fundamental issue. And I would just second State's uh, remarks about the change in the flow of information and discussion in China. In the mid-'80s, when 
uh, when I was state successor in his first tour in Beijing, um, uh, Hu Yaobang had a whole series <coughs> of little informal think tanks which were feeding all kinds of ideas to him, some of them, frankly, totally crazy. Uh, but he was willing to listen to them, and he, would, he was willing to think about them. Um, this problem of bottom-up communication uh, is a problem in both societies, but China has a far worse version of it than we do. You're right about the atmosphere. When I was there, I chose being ambassador much more smartly than the state did. <laughs> Because I was there between cooling off the Taiwan problem of the third communique and the beginning of the Tiananmen Square. When I was there, as you, and you said mid-80s, I was there the late 80s, yep. mm -hmm. Betty, my wife, and I would have dissidents, reformers, and party officials sitting around the same table talking about political reform. Mm -hmm. yep. I could go on for countless examples, but now, as you say, the, the atmosphere is really constricted. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Robert Taylor. Thank you. Uh, Robert Daly, the Wilson Center. A number of uh, colleagues and I were in uh, San Diego earlier this year with a, a group of senators and congressmen, and we did a four-day seminar on China, at the end of which one of the congressmen said, thank you, uh, that was very sophisticated, that was very nuanced, I get it now, but I can't bring all this nuance and expertise to my constituents. Can you, assembled experts, give me two sentences that when I'm home, I can tell my constituents to make them understand the nature of the China challenge, to make them understand that we may have to invest or pay costs to meet the challenge. And can you give me two sentences that in doing that, don't demonize China across the board and subject Chinese Americans to racial profiling? And we all stared at our shoes. Very tough to get that. And so I, I wanted to ask uh, the three of you, really, if you have any suggestions uh, for mm -hmm. much broader messaging that prepares the American people for whatever comes next. I mean, it seems to me that the simple view has been gone from China is open to China is getting rich, now China is dangerous. Uh, what, what should the message be for congressmen, for example, for constituents? I think that Senator Coons, uh, in his remarks at lunch. But that was a long, two sentences this is what we were challenged to give him. Um, <coughs> two sentences is what you have to use to brief the president. <laughs> But if you're talking to the American people, you can actually use a speech such as Senator Coons did. What I liked about his speech was he didn't gloss over all of the negative aspects of China, but he basically presented a positive view of how we could develop the overall relationship. And I commented to him after his speech, terrific speech here. But nobody in Congress gives a speech like that. And I think that's one of the major problems you have. Um, I think it's an, a, a nice exercise to think about two sentences to do it. But I actually think you need more than two sentences in order to capture the sense of what you need to do. And I thought the senator did a super uh, job of it at lunch. So um, if we don't get our fiscal act together, um, we are not going to be competitive. We are disinvesting in science. We are disinvesting in education. We are disinvesting in infrastructure, all of which are key to our competitiveness. So this is a far bigger question than China. You cannot run a country on <coughs> indefinitely repeated credit rollovers without eventually running up a, against a disaster. You cannot continue to increase the deficit in crumbling infrastructure and remain economically efficient. You cannot close your borders <laughs> to bright minds and hope to retain scientific and technological advantages. Um, I would say frankly, and this is not a political statement, it is a personal judgment, uh, quite aside from party, that what the Trump administration is doing in every respect is crippling this country for the future competition that we need to rise to. So uh, I guess the answer is uh, we need a deep process of introspection and redirection in our, in our country. <laughs>
and we have to be able to have to be willing to pay <coughs> what it costs to be excellent. Uh, I will try to respond to the two sentence uh, stricture by, by pointing out there's a new novel out. It, it was up for the Booker Prize, didn't win it, thank God. And I'm serious about this. It's one sentence that goes on for 500 pages. One <laughs> sentence. <laughs> so if she can do it, I can do it, right? <laughs> but I'll give you the components of two sentences, but of course, Stape is right uh, in terms of what you need more time, and the American people will, will stand for it. And, and you obviously were being somewhat uh, ironic. The first sentence would make the case, it would be a long sentence, and I won't give it, but I, I just give you the components. Uh, the China's not 10 feet tall, and we have tremendous assets versus China. I could elaborate, but I, I would just put in all the problems they've got and all the inherent assets we have. Uh, and the end of that sentence, uh, dangling participles would say, and therefore we should welcome this competition to get our act together. There's not an exact analogy to Sputnik. We ought to treat it like Sputnik. The Chinese are coming. Uh, and there is an extraordinary performance by them. We've got to get our act together. We can do it because look at their problems and look at our assets. And we did it in Sputnik. Uh, you know, maybe there's other analogies of going to the moon, and s et cetera. The second sentence would be essentially what Chaz just said, that we've, and which I've already mentioned, of how we go about doing it, drawing on our assets, which are, we are frittering away. And so I would, therefore, the first one's analysis, the second one's prescription. They'd both be long, but we can do it in two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, I, I'm going to add something on to this, because I thought that Assistant Secretary Stilwell, he quoted from a Xi Jinping speech. And in it, Xi Jinping said, the capitalist countries have the edge on us now in economics, in, the, in uh, military, uh, and what was the third one? Uh, what, whatever it was, he said they have the edge. What should we do? He said we should improve ourselves. We should raise our standards of living. So that, 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 that was the, the, the concept. In other words, instead of trying to react by holding down the other side, you need to make yourself better. And that was Xi's conclusion, that we're in this long-term cooperation and struggle with the uh, capitalist world we're going to show that our system is better. But he was frankly acknowledging at the moment it's not better. Well, I think he was right. We actually are better. And the trouble is we're acting as though we can't win a competition with China. And therefore, we have to try to cut them off at the knees. Mm. Final point, the Chinese have been stealing our intellectual property for how long? Decades? What intellectual property in China is worth stealing? Except in the military sphere. Peking duck. <laughs> mm -hmm. When you steal intellectual property, you haven't gone through the process of creating it. And we still are far better creators of intellectual property, and the Chinese steal it. But there's nothing there worth stealing that they have done in terms of developing intellectual property so far. Mm. So we have enormous advantages in this area, and at the moment we're acting as though the only way we can do it is to cut off Huawei at the knees. Huawei is good not because of government subsidies. It's because it has outcompeted us internationally in all of the third world markets of the world and in Europe. And that's why it is a, a tough competitor. We do not have a company that compete with, with Huawei right now, and so we're trying to cut them off at the knees. Hmm. It's not the way to win. Gentleman, question in the back. Before. Hi. Before I ask the question in regard of the function of diplomacy, today I would like to say thank you to Ambassador Lord, especially after 33 years. In the month of August in 1986, you and Betty kindly received me as a residence with the DC Youth Orchestra in Beijing. Oh. <laughs> Don't you remember? <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> I certainly do. It was a passage of 33 years. Right, thank you. I took the DC Youth Orchestra with 100 members, over 100 members, perform in Qingdao. You attended our first concert. You received me at the backstage. Mm. 
and arrange the orchestra to visit your residence after our performance in Beijing. Thank so you, I remember that, yes. It was a tremendous experience to the kids from DC. My question is, diplomacy could be going in different channels that affect multi-generations from time to time. So I heard about the function of diplomacy today at the new Cold War. I would like to hear uh, comments from the panels in regard of what can we do in the coming days for the uh, young people, how to deal with uh, the current barrier in regard to the Cold War uh, limitations. Thank you. I guess my answer would revert to the earlier question, sir. Um, what we are in is a competition to demonstrate which government, ours or theirs, which system, if you will, can deliver more domestic tranquility and prosperity to those it governs. And that is as simple as it is. Um, and it reinforces the point that to win that kind of competition, one has to excel and others have to see you as worth emulating. A uh, uh, quick comment. Oh, please, I, yeah. uh, I don't buy the assumption we're in a Cold War yet. We're in danger of sliding toward that. So let's not make that uh, inevitable, even as we push back, as I've suggested. We don't have to go into a Cold War. If you're touching on the question of exchanges, I'm not sure whether that was part of the question, here, as I would argue at Huawei, we need a sophisticated select approach. I do think there are probably, I'm not privy to the technology or classifications on the technology front in terms of Huawei, but there does seem to be some security considerations, but we shouldn't have a meat ax approach to Huawei. The same with uh, Chinese students and scientists. The worst thing we can do is to cut off the flow uh, of their coming here. It's in our self-interest, not to mention a buffer of stability in our bilateral relationships, so it's essential. But here there are some legitimate concerns about what some of the Chinese are doing on our soil. Now again, let's separate Chinese from communist Chinese. So I just want to make the point, we, we want to keep the doors open, uh, but there are some reasons for concern, and we've touched on them before. I don't agree with Stape that there's nothing, no intellectual property for stealing, stealing in China. I do business there, and they are becoming very, very innovative. And it, I, it's a matter of distress to me that we do not have our own scientific intelligence component collecting information on innovation outside our own country. Uh, I think that is too bad. But I want to make one point about, a uh, further point about competition. Um, China's now graduating almost two million STEM workers every year. We're doing 625,000. Um, China ha has- ha Half of whom are Asian. Exactly, well, it depends on the function. If, if it's computer science, it's about half. If it's artificial intelligence, it's almost two thirds. So, um, but, the, but the big point is, one fourth of the world's STEM workers are now in China and they're just beginning their careers. And if you don't think that's gonna produce something with all the money the Chinese are spending on advancing scientific research. You're living in a different universe than the one that I inhabit, which is the world of private business. I think we're gonna take one more question. Mr. McFarland, is the, the microphone is right there. Thanks very much to each of you for a superb analysis of what, where we are and what we must do to maintain stability in the years ahead. Let me ask you to drill down a little bit and talk for a moment about the role of energy, primarily from China's point of view. Historically, in modern times, they've been at a disadvantage, having only coal. A modern industrial society for transportation, China seems to have reckoned with that quite well and moving toward electricity, 
both to drive what has heretofore been driven by oil, and that is automobiles. They make 30 million of them roughly every year. So they're solving that problem, that challenge, and they're going to maintain a big piece of that market, I think. They're into nuclear power and civil power production very aggressively and successfully. It is a source for many in our country of concern that China building nuclear power plants and offering to build them in emerging markets on terms that are quite generous enables them to establish, uh, tell it what it is, strategic position, political influence in each host country as they come in and build nuclear power plants at scale. Well, it doesn't have to lead to their dominance of each new emerging market although being able to turn the lights off really is a fairly driving political power. What do you think is China's motive in what appears to be a quite aggressive move into developing countries, Africa, Latin America, with civil nuclear power? Is it or political influence? Is it simply to enable them to have leverage to be able to practice traditional mercantilist gain in other sectors, whether it's Congo and cobalt or whatever? How do you see China's energy strategy going forward? Shall I say something? I'm <coughs> but a uh, very good question, but required a lot of time to answer it. Uh, for the Chinese, um, natural resources generally, energy being um, among those, um, are a major challenge. Um, they will eventually uh, employ fracking, for example, to greatly increase their production in, of g oil and gas. But uh, the, they have more resources than we do in North America as a whole in that area. But those resources are in geologically complex formations quite a bit deeper than they are in Texas and Pennsylvania. Um, there is no uh, infrastructure from the past to repurpose rights of way, pipelines and the like uh, in those areas. And finally, there is very often no water. Hmm. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do, and I don't want to get into commercial interests, but um, I'm part of a group that has a, a process that makes concrete out of uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, rather than water. It's faster, more efficient, cheaper, and stronger concrete. Uh, and I'm trying to get it into China because 28% of China's greenhouse gas emissions are from the manufacture of cement. Uh, in four years, we think we could cut that in half, uh, this process retrofits. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the Chinese being their own uh, worst enemy. They have a ferociously competitive set of companies, bureaucracies, um, and in my opinion, we, you use the word strategy, very often they don't have a strategy. What they do is they announce some broad objective and offer support for it, and then they let everybody, as Deng put it, you know, cross the river by feeling the stones. Um, this is the case with the BRI. There's no real strategy there. It serves strategic interests, to be sure, but the specific projects are not controlled by any central authority. They're worked out directly between the uh, cooperating parties. We have a great deal to learn from the Chinese. This is an example of innovation. Uh, they are far, they have a great lead in the long distance transmission of electric power. Their systems are better than anyone else's in the world. They are now the leaders in renewables. Uh, and while they are not yet the leaders in nuclear, as you suggest, they 
they're making a lot of progress uh, with some of their own systems as well as those that they brought in uh, from abroad. Um, I, don't, I think the answer to your question about what they're up to with exporting nuclear power plants uh, is a combination of all of the factors you mentioned, but with the addition of one other. And that is, as Adolf Berl showed in the 1930s, what drives corporations is not the shareholders or the owners, it's the management committee. And Chinese state-owned enterprises are every bit as focused on the bottom line, even if many of them are less efficient than the private sector, as everyone else. My experience with them, doing business with them, is that they are very much like private corporation, privately owned corporations in the United States. Well, some question, is Lockheed Martin a private com uh, corporation? All of its money comes from the government. Um, anyway, uh, they are just as focused on keeping their distance from government minders, evading taxes if they can, and making big profits, um, partly for the prestige and partly for the rake-offs that this generates for management because China does have a corruption problem. So I think that all of those factors, influence, prestige, um, market development, leverage maybe, and profit, all combined. Very familiar story from uh, anybody who's looked at the American oil industry and its entry into the Middle East. Let me just add a word or two. But, so, uh, but uh, en en energy has been a crisis for China for decades now. So that they have had to address the fact that over a third of their energy requirements are imported now. So they have done everything with developing long range uh, gas pipelines from Central Asia all the way to Shanghai. Uh, if China now has a network of high speed highways that they completely lacked 15 years ago. If China reaches the level of automobile penetration that we have here in the United States, their daily consumption will be all of the available petroleum in the world mm. in terms of what's consumed now. So in other words, there's a crunch coming down the way. <laughs> and as a result, the Chinese are uh, putting a lot of effort into electric vehicles. But electric vehicles require electricity, of course, to charge them, and therefore they have a problem. They're rich in coal, but the coal has polluted their atmosphere to the point where Chinese no longer are willing to live in the polluted cities. So the <coughs> they've had to try to decrease the coal, and as Chaz mentions, they've moved into renewables uh, in a big way. Uh, but there are limits there. Chaz mentioned frac fracking. The problem is fracking requires a lot of water, and the water crisis Or CO2. China, it can be done with CO2. Well, if, 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 if they can develop that they can do it with CO2, uh, God bless them. But uh, uh, th they, ha they have areas for fracking, but the problem is the water supply yeah. that they don't have. Uh, so that this is an area, quite frankly, where there will be both competitive factors, but also areas for cooperation mm -hmm. between China and the United States. Uh, but from their standpoint, we are going to get lazy because fracking has all of a sudden made us energy independent. And so we're not going to do the things that we should be doing. China is being forced to do the things that they need to do it because the crisis is every day getting bigger. When, when they, when they. Just looking at one point. In the next 30 years, there'll be about 4 billion people in addition on the planet who'll never have electricity. When you pencil it out, it's an enormous amount, trillions of dollars, and somebody's going to provide yep. that. And a large part, part of the population increases in Africa. Yes. Well, today, uh, many analysts would say that China's going to dominate. Need a microphone. Providing electricity. They're good at it. They already have a large number of nuclear power plants in their own country. We haven't built one in 30 years and have no real prospect of doing it. So my point is this simply that I think they're going to go very, very heavily into nuclear power, civil nuclear mm -hmm. power, and capture that giant market. 
four billion of the 10 billion people there will be on the earth in about 30 years, so we'll be getting their electricity, their lights, and all of the other beneficiaries of nuclear power, uh, automobiles primarily, as you described, Steve. So they're on to something, and it makes great sense. But it's going to shift political pol patrol as control as well as they penetrate these markets. I had wanted to add a footnote to Stapes comments. The only country that responded to our call for ships to join us in protecting tankers in the Persian Gulf after the attacks on a Norwegian and a Japanese freighter apparently by Iran, those are allies of the United States, and after the uptake in Jerez oil fields were attacked, was China. It wasn't, it was a tentative offer, if it was an offer at all. Of course, in the current atmosphere in Washington, it got no response at all. The point I'm making is Stapes correct. Uh, the, drive, the drive on the part of the Chinese to address their vulnerability in energy is going to have geopolitical consequences. And we're either going to work with the Chinese or we're going to find them doing things that we don't like. Well, we've had a rich, full day of discussion on the uh, U.S.-China relationship. Uh, speaking for the Wilson Center, it was a pleasure partnering with the Nixon Foundation on this, Hugh Hewitt. Um, Hugh, over to you for uh, a final word. Just thanks to these three gentlemen and to everyone who has been here, either remotely via our live cast or here in the uh, auditorium. Nixon Foundation, the Wilson Center, hopes we can do this again. Thank you for being here today. Help me join the panel and thank you. <laughs> Safe travels home.